Good morning, Walter and Gozo, and welcome to another episode of Love and Daily. My name is JP, and today I'm joined by Tim Diakono. And this episode is brought to you by the Three Palaces Festival. The Three Palaces Festival is an interdisciplinary festival of the arts curated with architecture, history, and heritage at its core. The festival is started today and ends on the 15th of November, and you can find the full program online at festivals.mt forward slash the three palaces. We also have an exclusive Loving Malta interview at the end of this episode, so make sure to stick around with uh, Malta's newly elected MEP, Cyrus Engerer. And these are your five headlines for today. Robert Abela rules out lockdown and warns of pain it's causing peoples overseas. Malta's COVID-19 victim's daughter shocked after being told to pay for his fumigation and burial bill. Malta's foreign minister weighs in on divisive US presidential election. Spinola Bay development rips out heart of iconic 19th century villa and huge screen to replace live audience for next Malta's Got Talent phase. Tim? Yes, so the big story of yesterday, the Prime Minister categorically ruled out um, speculation that was making the rounds over the, in recent days that Malta's heading towards a total lockdown. Um, uh, and many European countries have gone down this approach during, you know, when, when hit by the second wave of COVID-19. But Malta seems to have adopted, it seems to, they have adopted a different approach, um, which, is, which is focused more on trying to bulk up the healthcare resources as much as possible while keeping, while imposing some restriction, restrictions such as, such as the masks mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. keeping large chunks of the economy open. Um, it's a it's a it's a bold move because you know it's the the, the, the convention is to go for a lockdown. Yeah. However, he seems quite adamant that uh, lockdown is detrimental. So yesterday he said that if you look at other European countries, you can see the the pain it's causing or the protests in the street, which actually defeat the purpose of of lockdown mm -hmm. in the first mm -hmm. place mm -hmm. in, in the UK and in, in Italy and in, in France. Um, meanwhile. Malta has, Malta's second wave continues to, to, to go on, 174 new cases of COVID-19 were confirmed yesterday, along with three other deaths yesterday, including a 54-year-old man, which is the second youngest person mm -hmm. to die um, with COVID-19 since the start of the pandemic. Two more dead people are where, on where, on for two more COVID-19 patients unfortunately died this morning. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I kind of somewhat agree with uh, the Prime Minister on this. Um, like I said, you see, you look at lockdowns around the world and it, it, it's, uh, it's particularly devastating on the economy. There have been protests and, and whatnot. And the last thing we need right now is more unrest. Um, even the WHO and certain public health professors are uh, warning against, uh, um, you know, going straight to a lockdown, advising that other public health measures are put into place and enforced effectively before the country goes into full lockdown. Malta has been in somewhat of a semi-lockdown earlier this year. It uh, hurt our economy, um, and that's you know what we don't want to see is you know a second lockdown where we're in a worse situation coming out of it. So there are other ways to to effectively deal with the pandemic according to you know uh, public health um, um, experts. Um, so I think we have to approach this cautiously before we take the most dra draconic measures. Uh, moving on to our second story, another COVID-19 uh, related issue, uh, one regarding a uh, COVID-19 victim's daughter who was shocked after finding out that she was to had to pay for the fumigation in his uh, burial. So, uh, basically, uh, the hospital had charged the undertaker who then passed on the bill to the family of this COVID-19 victim for the post-death uh, fumigation and the packaging of his body. Sounds quite grim, it's not something you'd want to receive. Obviously, when your um, you know father has just passed away, uh, the total amount of the bill was something around 900 and somewhat euros. But this specific you know, packaging and the post-death fumigation cost about 70 euros. More than just the money, it's a principle that you know uh, you you're grieving the loss of your father, and you receive this bill to uh, kind of clean his hospital space and, and package him and send him off. Uh, it kind of shows you know the grim side of this COVID-19 pandemic that. Uh, or you know, victim families have to deal with the emotional stress and whatnot. Um, you know, in fact, former uh, superintendent of public health, Ray Busatil, um, you know, called the whole process of uh, burying COVID-19 victims the whole, you know, um, a bit inhumane. Uh, you know, the fact that they're um, 
there, the coffins are in, their bodies are wrapped, wrapped in plastic. You know, they're carried out in hazmat suits. It kind of gives the scene of a kind of a post-apocalyptic world. You know, like uh, it really, really kind of over exaggerates um, what happened. And obviously, being a family and seeing this happen to you, it's the final moments you, you're with your loved one and seeing them being dragged out or carried out in a hazmat suit and whatnot. Really, just a grim image that maybe doesn't need to be uh, seen. What do you think, Tim? I think the the fact that the family is being asked to pay for the fumigation is extremely distasteful. But remember that the government has invested millions into COVID-19 prevention measures and the fact that it can't, it, it's not paying 70 euro to fumigate a body, I do, it just seems extremely distasteful. I, I, I mean, surely this can be solved because it's just an extra unnecessary pain yeah. for, for someone who has just lost their, lost their relative. Um, to, to, to this virus in the first mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. Moving on, believe it or not, but the United States presidential election is still ongoing. It seems that Joe Biden is in a clear lead at the moment, but it's so close that there will probably be a few recounts and legal challenges uh, within the coming hours. And um, in the midst of this, Everest Bartolo Mota's foreign affairs minister, you know, weighed in on how divisive this whole process has been. It's called, it's actually called it uh, the divided states of America. And he warned that, that politics has, and has caused severe, no, not polit politics, um, the, po the, the political divide has mm -hmm. caused mm -hmm. severe harm amongst families, breaking up relationships, ruining friendships. And, and yeah, no, I'm, I mean, I, 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 this is what I can see. I mean, I, I'm not in America, but this is what I can see from what I've been following. It is extremely bitter, almost like the Modi's election of three years ago, only with the two parties more evenly, evenly matched. And, 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 and yes, no, it just seems extremely ugly to see people. It's almost like a civil war at this stage, right? Yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit surreal. I mean, the, the whole, I think we take away from this is the whole political polarization that, that's kind of been brought to the forefront in the United States here. I mean, uh, in certain battleground states, you're seeing people protest uh, uh, threats of violence, um, uh, certain freedom of zone speech set up uh, because of this. Uh, challenges to, in certain states like Georgia, where we're, you know, it comes down to, it's come down to just about 400 votes. So we're for sure um, Trump, Donald Trump, who's threatened lawsuits before, will double down on this and, and call for a recount. Um, it's it's a bit scary, um, you know, to see the political divide. But like I said, Everest Bart will touch upon this. And really, what he said was 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 quite, was quite true when you see just how divided the country is, and uh, even after the election goes on, and it, it was, seems to be you know remain that way. People on both sides have have drifted further apart, um, and we're seeing this as the election unfolds, uh, as votes are counted, um, all the drama that's come through and whatnot since then. So uh, we just have to wait and see what the final outcome is when it comes out. Uh, moving on to our fourth story, uh, Spinola Development has ripped the heart out of the iconic 19th century villa. So basically last night, photo made around on social media of this old, ni old 19th century uh, seaside villa in Spinola, which actually happens to be the oldest, um, one of the oldest villas in the area. And it's just been uh, overtaken by this uh, in, in a, uh, you know, apartment infrastructure. Really, the only what's left is the facade of it. And um, no other way to put it, it is quite ugly to see what has happened to it. Unfortunately, it seems like the villa next door is about to suffer a similar fate. Um, and it just goes to show, you know, just the lack of care some developers have or in general water when it has, comes to taking care. I mean, I'm not totally opposed against, against construction and infrastructure right in the building of uh, certain high rise towers and whatnot, but when it's done at the expense of these old 19 uh, iconic villas, it's, it's quite sad to see. Um, yes, it's, it's, um, uh, Spinola is a very beautiful bay, very popular to visitors, but unfortunately, as we all know, its, it's landscape has completely changed. I don't think many people can say for the better. Um, finally, Malta's Got Talents um, is moving on to its semi-final stages soon. For obvious reasons, there cannot be a live audience, and so they're going to, make a, they're going to compromise by having a huge screen where people can um, can can watch live, as in there'd be a whole. Mm. This, is, this has already been done in, with Britain's Got Talent, and now we're going to be adopting it as well. It's a sign of the times. Mm -hmm. It's like how to you know kind of watch a watch a show with COVID nineteen. 
Although there is an element of it seems a bit sorry, it seems a bit you know black mirror. What do you think? Yeah, no, for yeah, for sure, it's it, it's it's uh, it's something we've never seen before. But obviously, throughout the pandemic, this time not just in Britain's on talent, but sports as well. We've seen these live screens, li this live audience. But it's necessary, you know, it's a necessary measure that needs to be taken during this time. So we'll just have to make do with what it is, and I'm sure a lot of people will enjoy the show. Uh, nonetheless, uh, just to remind you, this episode is brought to you by the Three Pass Festival, which is happening now until the 15th of November. We also have a uh, interview now with Malta's newly elected MEP, Sives Enjoy, so stick around. But before that, a quick word from our sponsors. A celebration of the arts in our beautiful surroundings. Experience the extraordinary within the palaces of your mind. The Three Palaces Online Festival between the 6th and the 15th of November. Produced by Festivals Malta. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, Cyrus. Um, Thank you for having me. So obviously, you were yesterday you were elected as Malta's sixth MEP, replacing Miriam Dali, who became an, an MP. Um, what you know, you're entering the European Parliament at a very sensitive stage in 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 in, in history. What what do you think are the three biggest challenge, challenges facing Europe right now? Well, currently, I think the biggest challenge is the pandemic for sure. Um, it is affecting not only the health of uh, all Europeans and all those people living in Europe, but also uh, our economy. So um, one of the biggest challenges, which is also um, being discussed at the moment, not only within the European Parliament's plenary, but also on various committees, including the one that deals with public health, is uh, the way forward on the pandemic, how to win this war, the pandemic war. And I, I think we're, we're on the right track now with the new vaccines coming out, um, the final testing on most of them. So now the most important thing will be distributing the vaccines to all uh, European uh, member states. And finally, obviously, to, to all citizens who live all across the European Union. One of the strengths of us being members of the European Union is um, buying the vaccine together with all other countries, so with economies of scale, we'll also get a better price. Mm -hmm. And the, the vaccine is estimated to, to be a couple of months away yet, at least until it starts being distributed on a, wi on, a, on a widespread level. In the meantime, the virus is still here, and many countries are going into lockdown. However, Malta seems to have has adopted a very different approach. It's kept, it has imposed restrictions, but it's kept large chunks of the economy open. You said a few months ago that you find the Swedish model of to, to COVID-19 interesting, and now Malta seems to have largely adopted that. What, what do you make of this approach? I mean, different countries will have different approaches, also because of the realities and the context within which they are uh, living, basically. Uh, I found the Swedish approach interesting because it was different to, to maybe those of main other uh, European countries, um, and it left its results. Obviously, there were uh, positive results and some negative ones. In reality, I think in Malta we're finding the right balance in the sense that um, the COVID cases have increased recently, although now it seems that it seems like they're settling um, to, a, to, to, to an average every day, which is nearly th the same all throughout. We have um, introduced a number of new measures during the past weeks, which I think will leave um, the results expected. Um, and I think one of the most important things is to make sure that um, people's jobs remain safe while at the same time safeguarding all those uh, who are very vulnerable. I mean, um, it is uh, a shame that we have had an, a number of deaths. Um, probably um, some deaths were inevitable, unfortunately. Um, but we need to make sure that we focus our efforts on keeping the economy going as much as possible whilst uh, making sure that all those vulnerable people are safe and 
um, being taken care of in the sense that if we have a strong country, if we have a, a, a economically, we can have then, and a strong country also when it comes to the health of the majority of the population, then that economic strength can help all those who are vulnerable and cannot, for instance, uh, go out to work at this moment in time because it would mean that they would be um, harming um, or putting at risk their own lives. So I think in a society in which um, we have a very strong um, social system, those who are stronger will help those who are weaker. And that's something that uh, we really believe in. And I know that the Prime Minister and the Cabinet also are quite keen, are quite keen on. What's the risk of a lockdown? Well, the risk of a lockdown would, would mean uh, job losses. Um, so that is quite, um, it, it, if it would come to that, obviously then that decision would need to be taken. However, I believe that we, we have found the right balance. I don't think that at the moment we need a lockdown. I remember that in March, there were many people who were calling for a lockdown. Uh, in reality, we didn't have a lockdown and we had very positive results. It was practically... Where, we had where, where, restaurants where? closed. Re restaurants, gyms, hairdressers... Yes, but it, but it wasn't... A, I mean, if, if you see Belgium at the moment, um, you cannot go out of the house. You can have only one person that they call is your cuddle person, for instance. You cannot have a, 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 other people. Uh, you need to only go out within the perimeter of your house and not go anywhere else. If you're going to the supermarket, you have to go alone and you cannot be accompanied by your partner, your children. You have to go alone. So, I mean, that is a lockdown. And I think we have never experienced that uh, in Malta. Without a doubt, these past months, have taught us a lot. Um, this was something new to everyone. None of us knew how um, a pandemic actually would, uh, what things would happen. Um, obviously, each pandemic is different in its own right, because every virus is, is different. So we had to learn. I think we have learned. Um, and on the whole, I think we have moved forward quite, quite well. Um, hopefully, uh, we will manage to keep numbers as low as possible uh, in the coming months. I have full trust in the Maltese public authorities, I, uh, the public health authorities. Uh, I think they have done an extremely good job, um, both uh, Professor Charmaine Gauci, the, the minister, uh, Chris Fern. I think what we have managed to achieve is really good, especially when compared to other uh, countries and compared to um, the forecasts that there were before the, the pandemic hit our country. Uh, and I think that is something um, we should be proud of, but let's not then uh, put our guards down because um, we, we need to keep um, being vigilant all the time. I think this is um, the most important thing. And when it comes to each and every one of us, our decisions will have an impact on the way that society will be affected by the pandemic. So the washing of hands, sanitizing wherever we are, wearing masks and keeping uh, some social distance, which obviously um, has been proven to um, give very positive results. Just to wind down this topic, what do you say to those people who are looking at other European countries, at the UK, at Italy, at France, and by Belgium? See in Greece now, they're seeing them, you know, locked down and they're saying, you know, Malta should follow suit as well. And they're asking, why? Why isn't Malta doing the same? Like, is, is the government just being completely arrogant and only focusing on, on the economy over people's lives? But, so how, how do you respond to these people? No, as well, I think that um, actually this government has shown how much it listens to um, people, how much it consults. Um, with everyone. We have seen various changing, changes during the past 10 months, not only on, on health, I mean in general. We have seen a government that really listens um, and consults. And I think this is what will keep on happening. Um, at the end of the day, this should be based on science. It should be based on um, what the public health officials uh, say and we move on from there. I am sure that the top priority for government is people's health. At the same time, uh, in order to safeguard people's health, we need a strong economy. And I think um, whilst having health as a priority, we need to uh, balance it out in order to have uh, the best po possible results. Um, I, I am very convinced that uh, the way, with, with the way we're approaching this situation and the 
um, the way that the politicians are listening to scientists here in Malta and moving on according to what the health authorities are advising, I think that we, we are managing to go through this very difficult patch in our, in our lives and in our history. And I, looking back, we, we would say that the right decisions were taken at the right time. Your election yesterday was kind of overshadowed by another election, which is still going on in the United States. What, what, what's your assessment of it so far? Well, it's a very close race um, between President Trump and former Vice President Biden. Um, it's very interesting. I mean, we were glued to the TV, um, not last night, the night before, um, seeing the different counts in different um, states and different counties. Um, it shows how much important it is for everyone to vote. I mean, the huge turnout in the United States uh, has shown that people are still interested in having their voice heard, voting, uh, maybe more than ever in the United States. Uh, it, these past four years, I think, have been quite turbulent. We have had a different president of the United States, which has fueled a lot of um, extremes in reality and has fueled a lot of people uh, in voicing their opinion. A lot of things happen. Um, uh, some things that maybe interest us, uh, we're quite far away from the United States. However, certain decisions do affect us. For instance, having the United States um, sign out of the World Health Organization during a pandemic when global solidarity should be uh, and working together should be the most important. We have seen uh, President Trump signing off the United States um, from the Paris Agreement on climate change. Uh, and I think these things have led to a very polarized um, situation in the United States, um, but one that will um, has resulted in, in, in the result that we're in a stalemate at the moment with both candidates being so close. I mean, in some states, the difference at the moment is of only 400 votes. That would be even small in a locality in Malta, let alone a, a whole state uh, in, in the United States. So uh, interesting times. Unfortunately, we have seen a number of um, statements by President Trump, which are uh, n not normal to be heard. Um, I don't know whether thing on impulse, which we have seen the president doing quite a number of times in the past four years, uh, or if he really believes what, what he is saying. But I think um, the most important thing is for the full result to come out, for every vote to be counted, and depending on the result, then move forward from there. Undoubtedly, there will be a number of uh, legal cases, unfortunately, that will unfold, and maybe some recounts as well, because the, 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 the small margin um, obviously would lead to, yeah. to, to recounts. You said that your, one of your priorities in the, in, in the European Parliament is going to be civil liberties and promoting civil liberties. Uh, in this respect, what's your opinion on euthanasia? I'm totally in favour of having the choice of euthanasia uh, in Malta. It is uh, a, a dignified death for someone who is suffering um, uh, an illness, a chronic illness, I think is the least that one could give. Obviously, it should always be voluntary, not mandatory. I really uh, liked what they have done in New Zealand and the referendum that they had recently. Uh, I think that is the way forward. And we must always strive to see that um, people who are suffering and who are crying out for um, them to be able to have a dignified exit from life to be able to do so. Mm -hmm. What about abortion? Abortion, I've always been clear on this. I mean, um, both political parties here in Malta seem to be um, quite strong on their um, opposition to it. At the same time, we are seeing a number of people in both parties at the moment speaking out in favour of the right to choose. Um, I subscribe to that right, I, I, I have always done. Um, obviously, the, th the thing is this, if anyone comes to me telling me that they want to go for abortion, I would convince them and try to convince them not to. Uh, there are other options, however, uh, there are a number of issues which I think we need to keep in mind. First of all, uh, it, we need to put ourselves in that person's uh, position, in their shoes. 
what is going on through their mind, what's happening, what their circumstances are, and why they want to go um, for, for that option. Uh, secondly, I think which is one of the most important things, let's stop judging those women who decide to go for this option. I am sure that no one goes for this option um, without thinking it through and I am sure that for everyone this is their last resort, their option of last resort. So let's make sure that whatever option women decide, let's at least stop judging um, the person. It is, I'm sure it's not an easy decision. I will wholeheartedly try to convince everyone not to go for it. Um, obviously, unless there are huge uh, problems for the health of the, of the mother um, or other issues which obviously can lead to um, severe problems. Um, rape, uh, obviously, it is the decision of the person. I mean, I, I, I met someone recently who told me that a 13-year-old girl who is raped and ends up being pregnant. This woman told me, what would I want for my daughter? Um, although I am totally against abortion, she said, I don't want my child to psychologically suffer and who knows, maybe end up killing herself because of what had happened. So let's, this is why I really urge everyone to just not judge people and I, try to help everyone out, maybe convince them and offer help. And I think the state should be there to offer help to anyone who is going through um, this situation and is thinking of having an, an abortion. And that help might lead to that person not having the abortion at the end of the day. But let us not judge and uh, let us, I, I know that this topic ends up um, having very extreme and sensitive um, reactions from people. And that is very understandable. It is, a, um, it, 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 is an, it is an issue that many people feel strongly about. And I can understand that. But I think the least that we could do is help these people out who, who are going, thinking of going for this option. And apart from that, try to um, not, not judge them. Let's put ourselves in, in these people's shoes and help them out and maybe try to convince them not to have the, 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 the abortion. I think the worst thing is uh, attacking this person, the, these, these people, and making them feel as if they are uh, they're doing something out of this world. I mean, we have seen what has happened in Poland in the past, in the past weeks. Poland, which has started firstly um, decreasing um, LGBTIQ rights, uh, they barely have any, but they also ended up having uh, LGBTQI um, free zones um, where various cities were subscribing to this idea in which no one could show or else show any affection towards a person of the same sex. Um, or having transgender people, etc. And now they are curtailing on women's rights. I think um, sexual and reproductive health rights are very important. They should be discussed and we should have women decide um, for themselves what is the best option for their current circumstances. So yesterday during um, your, your interview on, on Piazza, you said that the nationalist party's MEPs are ruining Malta's reputation by the way they speak in in Brussels. However, last year, you also said that Joseph Muscat should resign and that Kitsch Kembri and Conrad Mitzi have betrayed the nation. What, what's the difference here? Is it like you, you're saying the same thing that, that they said, right? My, my issue is this. If you have a position, stick to it, not only for your country, but for all other countries. I think what has happened recently vis-a-vis -vis Bulgaria is something which I cannot absolutely understand. I understand if you have a strong position on your own country and that you are making this fight. I would have... For the sake of people who might understand, this is Bulgaria when Roberta Metzala voted uh, to, to water down a proposal... Um, on Bulgaria's rule of law issues. Exactly, because condemning Bulgaria for its rule of law, right? Yes, and I, I think people should be consistent. Politicians should be consistent. I would have preferred to fight the Maltese fight here in Malta, which a number of people did in the Labour Party, uh, without uh, a lot of 
um, noise, without a lot of um, issues, but we have seen the result of that within the Labour Party and the way that government has acted in the past 10 months, which is a complete revolution, if, if I may say, when it comes to rule of law issues. And, and, and we have seen the, uh, a number of changes which were very good changes. One has to say another thing though, in the 25 years that the Nationalist Party was in government, they totally believed that the systems we had were good. And obviously, uh, everything can be improved, and we have seen an improvement during the past 10 months. But my issue is with consistency. So you cannot be saying one thing about your own country when you're abroad, and then say the right opposite um, on another country, which now, let's face it, we're speaking of Bulgaria. And I know many Bulgarian people who are, who are very strong um, when on, in their opinion when it comes to the situation in their own country. And l l let's, let's be consistent. I don't know, that may, maybe Roberta Metzola take this stance on Bulgaria because she wants the Bulgarian MEP's votes this week, this coming week, next week, and when it comes to her election uh, for Vice President of the European Parliament. Maybe, but let's show consistency. I think that is the most important thing because at the end of the day, we have a situation where it, it seems that with such an attitude, my question would be, are you there for your country or for the European Union to have a better European Union? Or did you take um, this stance on this particular issue for your own um, career within mm -hmm. the European Parliament? I think that is something that really needs to be it's a fair questioned. It's a, fair, it's a fair point, Cyrus. But the issue is, I do so, so. Should criticism then only be done behind closed doors? No, I'm not saying that. I didn't. I didn't do that myself. Exactly. I mean, criticism is always important, and it is what uh, makes us move forward and and improve ourselves. And I and I really hope that everyone keeps on criticizing. I mean, I myself am that kind of person, and I know that within the Labour Party, uh, self criticism is something that is really. Um, encouraged not only by, it was encouraged by the former Prime Minister Joseph Muscat, it's encouraged currently by the leadership of the Labour Party, Robert Abela, Daniel McAuliffe, the, the deputy leader who has spoken also quite strongly on euthanasia, abortion uh, and rule of law and, and all other issues. It is, the, the difference is um, constructive criticism and destructive criticism. And I think that is where everyone, each one of us, sees and judges for themselves. And finally, what do you make of Ben of Greg's time as PN leader has been a month? What do you make of him so far? Um, I think he still hasn't found his place. I think he went into this with the right intentions um, and is a breath of fresh air, maybe, compared to to his predecessor. That said, it, I, 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 I'm not seeing him um, moving forward and growing in this role. I mean, you might tell me it's only been a month. Sure, we can, we can ha give him the benefit of doubt uh, when it comes to this. However, I, I think the problem of the Nationalist Party is one of vision. It has no vision for the future. It is a party which is stuck um, in, in the past. It is a party that unfortunately has not moved forward. It's, it's still stuck with the same politicians that we have been seeing now for, I mean, since I was born, I'm 39 years old and I remember, I don't know, Francis Amid Demek, the Secretary General, Chen Sugalia, the President. They've been there forever. And I think, um, although people can change and can evolve in their thoughts and move forward, I think it is important to also have new faces, new people um, within the party and new ideas which unfortunately uh, seem not to exist at the moment in the Nationalist Party, which is a pity because I think we need a strong opposition in this country. Um, but I don't think that Bernard Greg will be giving us that strong opposition that we as a country really need. Cyrus, Cyrus Andrew, new MEP, thank you so thank much. You, um, that's all from us today on Love and Daily. Um, for make sure to follow loveandmalta.com for all the latest developments on these topics. And until then, have a day full of loving.